I'm Dave Thiel, and this is my charming co-partner. Butch Peel. Butch Peel. So this is the Thiel and Peel show. Peel and Thiel show, actually. Really? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I'm going first. This is the Thiel and Peel show, and I don't think I could say that more than once today. Uh, we're going to talk about pirates. So if you've come to the wrong place, expecting you know, us to talk about Tron, ain't going to happen. You ready? I'm ready. Uh, I, I, should, I should say, this may not be my finest day. I just got back from seven days in Germany where I gave a pinball talk last Saturday all day. I'm a little bit jet lagged, and he's a little bit rock and roll. And we can hear that, and then we can start all the moaning about where's the music from the first movie, and where's our Claus Badelt and Hans Zimmer. You don't get any. You get that. And I hope, I hope that you really come to love and enjoy it in the same manner that you've come to love and enjoy. He's a pirate. Okay. Let me be honest. Uh... I can. I'm going to be brutally honest. Truth bomb! Truth bomb! I turned this project down. Uh, in January of whatever year it was, 2016, I turned this project down. Why would I turn this project down? Well, I've done one of these before. I did Pirates of the Caribbean as the first pinball when I returned back to the industry making sounds in 2006 for a company whose name I won't say. And the Disney license on these properties is challenging. And it was, it was hard. It was very hard. And I just, you know, they said they were gonna do it again. I was like, okay. And then they told me, oh, we're going to get all the stuff, though. We're going to get all the stuff. We're going to get all the call-outs. We're going to get the music. It's just going to be great. I'm like, have you talked to Disney yet? But they were so confident. But then I sat through the first licensing meeting, and it was like, yeah, that's the Disney I know and love. Not going to happen. So I, I turned it down. Then, Mother Nature stepped in. Uh, what you're looking at is the back of my house, and there's like a, a concrete foundation, and underneath that is sort of a cave. Normally, there would be dirt there holding up the house. But I had a landslide at the back of my house, all the way across the back of my house, that compromised all 18 footings that were holding up things and sucked a whole lot of dirt out from underneath my foundation. All right, so I immediately called Chicago back up and said, you know that thing I said like three weeks ago? Forget that, I didn't say that. I'm a pirate. What was on my mind? So I, uh, you know, once I commit, I'm in. I'm, I'm totally in. So let me introduce you to the team. So there's Eric Meunier. And Eric's a younger guy. Well, from my perspective, everybody's a younger guy. And he uh, is a double E, and he's a mechanical engineer. He has degrees and things. And when he was hired at Jersey Jack, the first thing he did was to make light boards for the Wizard of Oz that actually worked. So you like Eric Monier right off. Uh, and he also is kind of like pinball royalty because he grew up in a family where his father, uh, when he retired, bought a couple routes in, a, in an arcade in Wisconsin. And so his entire childhood was involved in 
going out and servicing pinball machines, taking money out, fixing them, cleaning them, repairing them. He just kind of grew up in that environment, and it's just second nature to him. Royalty? Yeah. Well, pinball royalty. I didn't, I didn't say that he get the first choice of your, of your oldest daughter or anything. Uh, so you know, he got this shot at Jersey Jack to design this game of this very visible, you know, cool license. That's Eric. He's cool. And Keith. Should I say anything about Keith? Everybody knows who Keith Johnson is. Okay. Joe, though, you don't know Joe Katz, and Joe's one of the uh, newer guys at Jersey Jack, and Joe has done a lot of work on Dialed In, and he's done a lot of work on Pirates as well. He's a very talented guy. And JT, and I frankly don't know what his first name is. Nobody does. He's just JT. In fact, they got a lot of J's around Jersey Jack. They got Jersey and Jack and Joe and JT and Jay-Z. I think that's a criteria. I don't know. But he's very good, too. And all these guys, all four of these guys can play the pants off a of pinball. They're all... Uh, well, Keith has been a ranked competitor, and I think Joe is as well, and JT. They all play pinball really well. Oh, yeah, and that other guy off in the Netherlands somewhere. Uh, JP, Jean-Pierre, Jean-Paul. Yeah, yeah, thank you. John Paul, who really single-handedly has begun to answer the question, you know, here we have a high-def screen that we slapped in the back box of a pinball machine. What the hell do we do with it? And he's invented an awful lot of what you do with high resolution and what might be good for the player and would be good for the game and at the same time beautiful and dynamic. JP's really great. So that's the core team. You know, Ted's out there somewhere doing stuff, but this is really the core uh, program. And these are my clients. So, uh, hands. How many people have played Pirates of the Caribbean, the new one? Okay, and... Uh, this is a Keith design from the ground up. Uh, there's, except that th there's really only one mode that's not a multi-ball or a wizard mode in Pirates. One for a Keith game. That's incredible. Of course, it has 132 variations. That's 100 more variations than the 31 modes that are in The Hobbit, you know, so it's a Keith game. Um, but Keith won't allow the chapters to be called modes. Really, chapters are one mode with all these variations. And they're made interesting because they involve the 22 characters that were extracted from the pirate movies. So when you start a, ch start a chapter, between 2 and I think 11 of these characters populate the top of the screen. Can you see that? The Adventurous Miss Swan. There you go. That's a sample of, of a chapter, right? So you see all these things across the top of the screen. We got five of them. And uh, this one features the adventurous Miss Swan. The deal is, labeled on every picture is the name of the shot that's associated with that character. When you make those five shots, you've completed the chapter. How hard is that? to understand. It's not that hard to understand. That's pretty cool for a Keith game. Um, now, presented with 131 potential flavors of mode, the sound guy said right off, I am not writing 131 tunes. This is out. I'm not doing it. Even if I could, I wouldn't. That's dumb. But what we did instead was I wrote a tune for every one of those characters. So there's 22 characters, and every character has their own very distinctive piratey tune that hopes it somehow speaks to the nature of their character in this five-film epic. 
the adventurous Miss Swan. So this is Miss Swan's tune. That's piratey, ain't it? Yeah, piratey. Okay. Yeah, Arr, it's piratey, piratey. Now, when you play this particular mode, uh, one of the 131 modes that features these five characters, you won't necessarily hear this song every time. It, you'll hear a song associated with one of those five characters. And the way we choose this is least recently used. So we keep track of when we've used these pieces of music. So if uh, on player two, that player plays that mode, they have a real high probability of not hearing that tune. They'll, he'll, they'll hear a tune that goes with that chapter, but it will be uh, one of the five. So I thought that was a fun way to deal with it. And I'm going to play one more just because this is one of my favorites. The Horologist, Karina. The Horologist. Before you get your panties in a bind, horology means the study of time, okay? So in the fifth movie, we have this new character, and she's kind of a scientist, so they want to treat her as a witch. And so I gave her this tune. I, th I thought this was fun. That handsome devil Gibbs. Okay, the other thing, uh, and, and, and if you haven't detected, I now have honest enthusiasm for this title that I didn't even want to work on. Uh, because Eric and Keith primarily, I'll lay it to them, they worked around all the constraints that we were given and found ways to bring all five movies and all the characters and every chapter of every, uh, in every CD to this title, and really it's just like thoroughly Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and one of the choices, since we had no access to any of the dialogue from any of the movies, is Jersey Jack spent the big bucks, more than normal, to hire Kevin McNally, who is a union actor, and that's important, in terms of our constraints, um, and we hired him to do a custom recording session. Now, we had him say about 100 lines that he had said in all five movies, because he's one of the only three, three actors that uh, is in all five movies. I should have my hand model do that. Sorry. Uh, and Kevin, you know, when you do casting for a pinball machine, you can do a good job or you can do a bad job. So a bad job would be hiring the, the, the nerdy techie girl from, for, for 24. She just was so inappropriate and not pinball. Also the doctor for CSI. Great actor, Robert David Wilson. I, he was a wonderful guy, but he kind of talks like this when he sees his character. And he's that one-legged doctor on CSI, and he kind of talks like this. Just doesn't work for pin jackpot. Doesn't work for pinball very well. And then if you say, you know, you know, yell, well, he's an actor. He yells. And then all of a sudden, he's not the character from CSI. So casting is everything. And it seemed very clear to me, and we all kind of agreed, that getting Gibbs is the man for pinball. He's, he's, he's totally appropriate for pinball. He's Jack's first mate. He's always there. He's yelling at the crew. He, you know, he's very cool. So... You've got to shoot better than that. 
I'll do it again. You gotta shoot better than that. So, you know, you give him some Steve Ritchie lines to read. You gotta shoot better than that. The bright side is, you're back. Okay. So, we had a first recording session. We got a ton of good stuff. And things were really happening, and this was going to be great, and I really liked it. And the lack of having other voices or having other characters from the movie saying lines that have nothing to do with pinball really didn't, I, I didn't bother me. And I think this call out was really beginning to work. And we knew we were going to have a pickup session, which turned into basically a session as big as the first one, as we added features and, and uh, figured out what we needed. On the day of the session, a couple days before, um, who doesn't know what Pinside is? Well, you aggressively don't know what Pinside is. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows what Pinside is. And, and we all know what a, a, a toxic place it can be. And I typically bravely put on my hip boots and I monitor about 40 threads and I look and I see stuff. And you know, actionable, useful stuff on pinball for a pinball company is typically fairly small. However, we do pay attention. On the morning of the session, there was a suggestion made by, I forget who it is, so I can't give him attribution, and I mentioned to Eric, I said, this guy gave a really great suggestion. Maybe we should do this. So we fabricated the script on the morning before uh, Kevin showed up, and we did it. So, oh my God, we did something based on Pinside. And, and what we did, Good shot! So, on the character things, when you actually made one of those shots that were called out, you know, if the left ramp is associated with Jack, you know, uh, we had him, you know, say, good shot, you know, it was kind of generic. And the suggestion was, is that we identify which shot was made by character. But that means we have to record 22 callouts, which we did. So, uh, yeah, we recorded the 22 character names, and this is an example. Collected Norrington. Collected Norrington. So now you know you were trying to shoot that thing, or maybe you weren't, but you, you got one of the five, because he won't say that unless it's one of the lit shots. Cool. But we took it one step further. I said, you know, it'd be really cool if we... Uh, kept track of the shots and then told you to increase the tension because the, every, these are all timed. You have 30 seconds or so to make these shots. Two characters to get. Ooh. So when you get to that state, it yells that out and you go, oh, I got 10 seconds to get these last two characters. Only Governor Swan left. Then we recorded 22 more that tells you you only have this one shot. So if you shoot that... Uh, right ramp only governor swan left that's associated with governor swan you will then complete the mode so I, this is all very useful stuff and it's pretty motivating and it accomplishes that goal of making creating those little pockets of tension that make it more exciting all right um i've got one thing left but it takes a while and i did this partially because I won't do these kind of things live. There lies madness, they're too complicated. And the other thing was I wasn't sure I'd get back from Germany in time to do this because I was flying Condor. Who knows what Condor Airlines is, right? And my wife, after I bought these tickets, then my wife, bless her soul, was going through and finding like uh, five and one ratings for Condor where people were getting stranded in somewhere for days. So, <clears throat> so I did this. And I gave it to Butch just in case I didn't show up here today. So these are autopsies because these pieces of music are no longer live anymore. They're dead. And I'm going to take them apart in pieces and kind of explain why I assembled these pieces and what they're supposed to be doing. On Stranger Tides Wizard Mode. Let's do a Wizard Mode autopsy. This Wizard Mode is On Stranger Tides, which is the fourth movie in the series. It has themes of the Spanish and the Spanish Army, features the lovely Angelica. I wrote a piece that contains seven segments, and it's about a minute long. 
like a lot of the music that I wrote for Pirates of the Caribbean is based on a dotted eighth figure, and that means it sounds like this. Okay, very much bouncy, dot, 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 instead of bah, bah, bah. Actually, there's another piece that goes through here that's more typical. That's straight ahead, and I'm using that as a counterpoint against the bouncy stuff to give it a bit more force. Spanish theme is based on guitars. Surprise. Okay, there's our Spanish theme. We add to that trumpet, a Spanish kind of mariachi trumpet to that. With the percussion, the introduction section sounds like this. Section two introduces the notion of the Spanish and their army. They're kind of the bad guys, and their theme is in the low brass. We also introduce pretty rhythmic bass drum playing. With the other percussion, and then the sort of disco percussion. So, section two. Now, the Spanish have brought an army along with them to stop our pirate buddies, and I'm letting that be basically the drums and the percussion. This starts to get more military with the addition of some snare. Plus, we have some what I call pirate percussion, which is not typical instruments, but rather the kind of percussion that would have been played by pirates with the stuff that they brought with them. And that's doubled in the bass drum. And then we add some snare drum to that. And then cymbals always make things military. So, this section Okay, but our party band of pirates led by Captain Jack are characterized by a little jig that I wrote, and this is played by the cellos. Which is on top of the Spanish theme, which is the bad guys. Now, we have brought along the lovely Angelica, daughter of Blackbeard and a former consort of Jack's, and her theme is uh, on the guitar. But it's over some of the heroic pirate changes, chords, some percussion. Now, what we're trying to do, what the pirates and the Spanish are trying to do, is bring together some goblets with a tear from a mermaid. The mermaids have their own theme, or their own contribution, which is mermaid-like. So, that's another chunk. And then the climax of this mode is based on a, well, it's a riff which starts on the guitars and then gets made bigger. Then we add some strings to that. Then we add the low brass to that. And then the final, final pass around, we add a trumpet. So the entire end section, which gets bigger and bigger, of course, also loops around to the beginning, because we have no idea how long you'll stay in this mode.
Wizard Mode 4 finally gets coded, and they tell me what they did. There are five stages, and each stage has a different focus. And the first stage is a combat stage where you're fighting with soldiers. I started with the original theme, and I took a chunk of it, and then I extended it. So the intro to the original sounds like that with the guitar and the Spanish trumpet. And I used the second part of that, but then I extended it because this is going to loop now because it's a timed stage. If you don't get stage one done within a certain amount of time, the wizard mode's over. this, we have guitar and strings doing something that creates tension. On the guitar, it's... And on the strings, similar. So you can combine those two. We also have the other guitar doing a rhythm thing. So that guitar plus the other guitar. That gets combined with the rhythmic elements that we already had. Okay, so now we've got the music for phase one. Then I compose something completely different because phase two involves the mermaids. We're still Spanish. We have the mermaids. And they're playing some kind of ethereal changes. Second time through, we have a cello doubling the uh, guitar. So we have another 30 second loop, which is for phase two, and it all revolves around the mermaids. So let's shift gears here. I also wanted to do a deconstruction of how we convey scoring to the player when they're making the shots and making progress toward completing the mode. And the mode's in five stages, and that's how they programmed this. So then we changed the music to have five discrete loops so that as you shifted from stage one to two, you'd know it. Then the scoring events for each of the modes need to be different to work with the music and also thematically work with what you're trying to do in the mode. Stage one characterized to me as a combat stage where they show a number of soldiers on the screen and lit shots on the play field. And you have to make those shots and you take down the soldiers and you've taken all five down, then you have completed that mode. So that's over this background that we deconstructed. This is some kind of piratey battle. In that piratey battle, we have piratey weapons. That's a swinging a fist and a big cutlass. Another swinging of a fist. Ooh, somebody just got stabbed. That's a single musket shot. So if we play these sounds over the background, you can see how the player could tell they've done something. But that's kind of a naive approach to creating these fanfares that are supposed to be very rewarding. These shots are hard to make and you want to know you made them. 
So over this background of music, when these scoring events happen, we add a human sound, we add a human reaction. Oh. Mm. Oh. Uh. So these two together, they're offset in time a little. Oh. Um, it's a busy background, so we need something big to let the player know things are happening. But, I don't know, I don't think it's really rewarding enough yet, because these are big shots and you're getting big points for doing this. So, we add some orchestra elements. These are somewhat discordant, and uh, the gestures are real big, uh, what the orchestra is doing. That's, that's beginning to sound like combat, right? We aren't aligned to the background music. We don't know where the music is. So these things are pretty much atonal. They don't have like a chord or something they're trying to play on top of. So they'll work anywhere. So we put these three together without the music. <laughs> we go. Now we're doing something. And the point is to be thematic. So this is combat and it's to be big, which I think these are, and for them to be able to work anywhere on top of the music. So they sound like this when they're on top of the music. Now, this is also reinforced by something on the screen, which changes to show you you've scored that particular shot. I'm not going to talk about all the sound effects in detail. That would be too tedious and we're running out of time. So I do want to talk about the last stage of Wizard Mode 4. There are two things you need to do. One is to get the ball into the chapter area, and then you need to make the upper left loop shot off the upper left flipper. Now, the background for this, we sort of took apart, and you've heard. There's mermaids, there's guitar, it's very busy, and it's got that... that riff. When the ball goes into the chapter area, an up post comes up, and then the magnet moves the ball around. Then I made a, a series of sounds that can happen is the ball gets whipped around there. It can get quite, quite kinetic, quite frantic. And so let me play some of these without the background and I'll kind of simulate the way they might get triggered by the magnet. This is a technique that I use with fanfares and sound effects a lot is, is the notion of ascending. There's an arpeggio on the harp for every one of these. There's a, a hit sound and a, and a cymbal sound to make these things a little bit bigger. The female uh, choir, the, the mermaids ascend as you hit these things. So on top of the music, one more time, it sounds like this. So we've discussed a lot of the chunks and the things that go into doing one wizard mode. Uh, there are five of them, and all of them are equally in involved. Keeps me uh, keeps me working. <laughs>that last thing is when you've accomplished everything in wizard mode 4 and you make that last shot you get that video and that sound effect and mode complete few mortals will ever see this that was part of the reason why i wanted to make it part of my presentation that at least with the glass on yes me too okay
No questions because we got to get right to Butch. So you take this. While you're, while you're doing that, if anybody has anything, hit it. That's uh, for this project, totally VSTs. Uh, the question was whether I recorded any live musicians for this or whether I used uh, virtual synthesizer technology. And this is all VSTs. It's the fastest way for me to work. I used, there have been times, uh, not many, when I've used real players on Spider-Man. I actually hired a local guitar player and I went to his house. I had some music minus one tracks and he blew my ears out in his living room doing this thing. It was very cool. And then I, I took all that stuff from that session and, and that's part of Spider-Man. Uh, but I usually, I have no budget for live musicians. They, they just give me some money and, and so I try to do everything that I can. And I have a ridiculous, I have a ridiculous collection of virtual synthesizers. Uh, it's humbling. It's like going into a library and knowing, damn, I'll never be able to read all of these books. Well, that's, that's my VST collection. I, you know, I'm, I'm really in a totally command of about 8% of it. So, thank you, great question. Alrighty, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here, talk a, a little bit about the, uh, the making of the Pirates of the Caribbean game, a little bit of a, a view behind the scenes. So, as uh, this game started as, as uh, as Dave was saying, we, we started with a young, new designer, and that's what you get is just sheer enthusiasm when it comes to starting to make a, make a new game. So he's, that's his first play field and uh, first routing and all that. Um, the very excited kid ready to, to avoid his play field is kind of what I call this picture. So. So here's a, a little bit of how that play field gets made. You know, you have a, a, a lot different technology than the white woods of the days past where they had to get in there with, with uh, power tools themselves. Now we have these shop bots that do this kind of work for us. You pr program in where you want the holes and things and then they're routed out very nicely. So a white wood actually comes out looking uh, a quite a bit more like a, a production play field because the, the holes and everything in it can be, can be done so well. I kind of turned the volume down here so you don't, you're uh, spared that e sound that you have to wear hearing protection for and, and all in the, in the shop. But, you know, all the holes, all the, the spotting, everything can be done by these things with different bits in the, in the, and they're very, very capable. Um, when you come to do things like routing out just uh, where magnets go and things like that, uh, very, very handy to, to be able to do something like this rather than get in there with a, your own router and, and try and make these perfect circles. Uh, this is much, much better at doing that. Let this thing run out there. That's all CNC. Yes. Basic shop bot tool, very, cool, very handy. Um, one of the first things that you want to decide as you set out your play field and your drawing is, is where the ball is going to be able to go. And uh, that's done a lot of these days with, with what we call flat rails. So these metal uh, channels are set up over the play field and you're, you know which, what your loops are, you're defining how your ball is going to go around the play field, where it's going to be uh, rubberized and bounce off. You notice the, there are no direct shots from the flippers onto these metal flat rails. You'd never want a ball slamming into a, a metal flat rail. So they always have a pre present to the flippers kind of a very um, upright and straight. So you're shooting alongside them and you're grabbing the ball and, and forcing it into loops and things like that. Very, very cool part of the, of the setup is the flat rail setup. I'm kind of uh, enamored of the, the new uh, PowerPoint uh, changes, transitions between slides. So I tried to make one that used every single one of the different things. So you'll see a different one every time. But um, the white wood underside, very primitive uh, at first. You know, you start adding the, the very common things like your, your pop bumpers, your flippers, your trough. Um, drop. You see up at the top of the, the play field, I, I think I can use like a little laser pointer here. See at the top of the play field that early on Eric had a, a a three bank drop target in this design and that was to basically 
do what the light lock does for the, the treasure chest right now. So it was three drop targets that hid that. You had to knock them down in order to get a ball to lock up in the chest. Um, some of the things that changed during, during the development process. Um, you get all your targets in, you get um, some of your switch slots and things like that, and uh, then your wiring just becomes just this rat's nest here of, uh, you know, get it to where it needs to be right now. We'll figure out a more logical routing and a better production routing much later. You can even build your own ramp. Um, you just get a couple of, this is the kind of ingenuity that you use when you don't, you can't go out and just, you know, vacuum form and make things of your, your own the first time. So, you, you know, I didn't think there were that many clamps in all the world, but, you know, that, that's like buying out Home Depot or Lowe's, you know, you just go down and say, I need every clamp you got. And why I'm, go I'm making a pinball ramp and they'll just give you that funny look, you know. But, yeah, the final, Result here, you know, you, you want a uh, funnel ramp, well, you know, you use a funnel. So you go, you cut the, the pieces off of it and you, you're able to, to let the ball fall down in through the play field like it did here. And you don't want to get too close at some of these early wire ramps and things or you'll be wearing one of those black eye patches yourself because it's very jagged and edges are, are, are not a big deal. So it's, it's all about getting the ball from one place to another and getting an idea of how that will flow. There's a, the first white wood in the cabinet. Um, you see, uh, finally get you a, a nice uh, uh, apron on the bottom and you figure out how you're gonna mount your little screen on down here for your compass. Um, get to finally see all the wiring and things working in your switch matrix and be able to test all those sorts of things and get it ready for programming. In this time you're moving forward, you're just gonna continue to draw. You're gonna print out drawing after drawing of the play field and you're gonna go in and annotate. You're gonna just move around and tweak and change uh, placement of uh, a bunch of different inserts. You're gonna see what looks good, what works good, what, you know, how many shots of these you need for however many different scenes in the movie or characters, all those sorts of things. And then you're gonna pass that on to your artist who's already starting to mock this up and, and put play, uh, faces and, and artwork on the play field. Very cool um, collaborative process. Uh, I had somebody at Golden State ask me, you know, when does the, the electrical guy get in talking with the mechanical guy and the designer and the software guys, these guys are all working together all at once. They start at the same starting line and they all get to the finish line together. So, you know, things like uh, how, a, how a motor spins, how fast it can go, um, how, how much uh, current it's going to draw, all these kinds of things are all being taken into account by all these different uh, areas in design as you, as you build a game. And during this time, you're having a lot of uh, discussions in your office and you're making notes on all the different movies and what type of modes and who, what type of characters and maybe what kind of shots even. And this is like one of five different uh, whiteboards full of stuff that Eric, you know, and these guys are writing on and you take a picture of that and you erase it all and you start over again and you're just trying to capture all the ideas and, and keep everything fresh in your mind as you decide how this game's gonna play. What's a game, a play field without inserts? Well, pretty boring, you know, because that means no lights and, and things when we use RGB LEDs for all our feature lights, you know, that's where all the color comes through. So the more you can perforate a play field, and they did a really good job of perforating this one, the, the more light's gonna get through, the more things are gonna be shown, uh, indicators for shots and things like that. It gets really interesting. Again, here you see the three bank drop target guarding the, the fork mix, which would allow the ball to, to be locked in the, in the chest. You see tons of other little things where you say, well, maybe, maybe now instead of putting five of these little inserts here and lighting each one as you go up, maybe I have a color train and I just use one big arrow here and I change that color each time it, it increases one value so that I don't have to have all of these little lights. Because when you start putting a, you know, an RGB LED behind every single one of these little holes in here, that gets kind of crazy to, to control and starts getting a little expensive as well. Then you glue in all of your inserts and you clear coat and now you've got something that's pretty, you know, close without artwork to a uh, production type play field. And very, very clean holes, very, very easy to uh, see how it's going to look when you start wiring and doing those sorts of things. Some of the tools that a lot of other companies use, ah, 3D printers, that, that solves all your problems, right? You don't have any, any issues. You can print out anything you can think of. Well, sort of. Um, this was a, 
a, a mock-up of a wire form that was going to be used for that trunk lock. This was going to mount upright and the ball was going to come up through here and drop into the chest and uh, you know a couple of hits with a ball it starts to break and maybe it didn't quite fit right. The, the, it's never smooth so the ball doesn't want to roll on it. It's not not quite the tool for for making ball paths and things like that as you might think it might be. So this is how we make a, a vacuum formed subway mold. Uh, after you've made a few of those with you know and you've bought out all the clamps at Home Depot, you start thinking you know there's a there's a machine that does this. We could get one of these. You you tell it what you uh, what you want your your um, ramp or your subway in this case to look like, and then you you can program that in to a 3D software that will control your ultimately control your power tools. And you can kind of do a rough, a rough uh, run through here of what that's going to look like and see how, it, how it's going to shape it and how the different bits. You'll see the bit is great, great big right now and it's running around the whole thing. As it uh, gets closer to doing something, a finished product, it gets most of the wood away that, that needs to be gone. It's going to go to a smaller size bit and then start moving in very, there it is, their smaller bit. Now it moves in just one little section and moves over a little section, moves in one plane, then moves in the other plane and makes it as smooth as you possibly can. And then when you're all done doing that, it sounds like somebody's making a ramp back there, as a matter of fact. As you're done doing all of that, then you can uh, do a final sanding on the, th on the thing and smooth it out as best you can. And you, you'll see if you play the game inside there, you'll see some of the, the wire ramps or the um, plastic ramps in there have a, like a texture to them. The, the production ramps will be crystal clear like, like always. It's just this is a result of byproduct of, of using this kind of, a, of a, um, a mold, a wooden mold like this. So it makes something with a little bit more texture to it. So all of that leads to the, the controlling the saw and cutting something that looks like this. Then you put a piece of plastic over the top of it. You heat it up. You suck all the air out. It, it takes the shape of the wooden, um, wooden mold and then you cut it all out and all of that leads to this little guy right here this little bitty piece right here that goes around the outside of this and drops the ball from back behind at the top of the play field drops it down into the um, the subway and into the vuck that then kicks it up onto the upper play field so that just that little bitty plastic part was all all that work was to to get something like that here's um, testing you, how you can decide whether your upper loop shot's going to work and how much, of, how much or how little I can get away with using pieces of that flat metal to be able to make a functional upper shot. So they just test this literally with just a few pieces of those metal flat rails um, and a, an active flipper um, hooked to the play field and you can, you can make these shots over and over again and see what, if that's going to work or not and how, many, how much you can get away with. And you can see when you make it well and that, that's kind of a thing you, you want people like Keith and those guys in there to come in and they say, hey, make this shot like 40 times in a row. Oh, okay, no problem. You know, me, I can't even do it with my hand trying to make it do it. So that's a, a little different ball game. Here's a, putting the, the Black Pearl Mini Playfield onto that white wood. Um, you don't realize how much, you know, when you start adding a play field up there that rocks back and forth and now you've got stuff on top of that play field, you've got things under that play field, how many clearance issues you start to get into and how far you can tip from one side to the other. You've got your glass above you, you've got uh, the cabinet walls on the side, you've got um, targets and, and flipper mechanisms and things underneath. So, you know, it, it, you think, well, I can really make that thing rock, I've got all this room. Well, when you start populating it top and bottom with sculptures and things like that, it, it really cuts down on your, on your ability to, uh, to rock. So you've got to make a, a, a nice um, compromise there on how much stuff you put on the play field and how much you want it to actually be able to move because underneath it, there's, there's the cannon sticking out. Um, you know, see that that isn't going to be able to move too far before it starts hitting the plastic that covers this chapter area and these and these targets underneath. So, they they originally, for for, for instance, they originally thought they might be able to put a, a cannon sculpture on the side of that play field so you could see that there's a cannon under there and it would fire through this cannon sculpture. But there's just not enough room to do that. And then you see the other results of prototyping when you don't use the fancy uh, shop bot back there and you just chew a hole in something like this or when you get done you chew on your switch a little bit over here on the side. So whatever it takes to get your, 
your prototype up and going. Here's a little video showing the first time they had some lights on the play field. So this is very exciting, obviously, when you light all these things up. Um, you see the, the constellation on the back panel back there is really cool, too. It's able to, to put a, a star, star fields and, and, and constellations and things up there that will be used in the game. Very, very cool feature. Spotting holes are everywhere. Um, everything that the designer decides to put on the play field, someone else at the factory has to take with screws and fasten it there. So all of these spotting holes, this is just the underside of the play field. Um, you see all the little holes and everything. Anytime anything, a target or a, a flip, a mechanism, anything changes, moves a little bit, all of these have to be revised and put in the right place because you don't want a guy up at the factory just taking a screw gun and a flipper mech and saying, well, that looks right to me and, and putting it in there. He, it's got to be very, uh, very specific in all the mounting. Um, so that, that's something that just um, grows by leaps and bounds as you add more stuff and you, you see when we lift our play fields up you know you know where your money's going because there's just no room for anything else under under the underside hey, you make sculpture mock-ups it, it's pretty cool they, they go in and, and print some some paper paper out use some uh, you know razor blade knives and and uh, and a little bit of foam and you can make some some really cool mock-ups of what of how much you know just in physical space you start to out how your sculptures are going to fit in there and as uh, you know a certain competitors game says you shoot here and here and here it's uh, it's really fun to watch Jack interact with with Steve Ritchie he walks up to him the first time he sees him and starts pointing at him and says shoot here and here and here and uh, without missing a beat Steve Ritchie always says I need your boots and your motorcycle <laughs> it's, just, it's just so funny to watch him do so that hole in the ship is what you shoot to, to get the super jackpots and things like that when you're doing that, that multi-ball. First printed play field, uh, very exciting too when you get to see the artwork interacting with all of the mechanisms and targets and lights and everything. Very, very cool point in, in development. When you can uh, add a animated topper to the CE game, that's very cool too. That's some really rough seas right there that that ship's going through for sure. But, um, Kind of a cool idea to be able to put all of that into a bottle. That, that's really where it comes in cool. So you make one of those uh, fancy wooden uh, molds again and make you a bottle and you can close it all in there and it, it makes for a really cool top. You put a little a couple of LEDs in the background, flashing lightning and things, a little artwork in there. Uh, yeah, sprinkle a little bit of this, sprinkle a bit of that and you come up with something truly spectacular. So uh, where's the rum? A lot of a lot of you, you know, you've seen the movies. You've been on the ride. You've been to Disneyland. Um, we this was uh, early on some the idea that they were using for um, for the two spinning pop bumpers in the game. A, a, a pirate ready to to duke it out with somebody and a, a barrel that had a bunch of rum bottles and 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 decanters and things like that. And this didn't fly too well with our, with our Disney folks. They looked at that and they said, you know, we don't want any alcohol in our games or, you know, fist fighting. That doesn't fit. Um, and to which you answer, you know, did you actually see the movies? Have you, you know, the rum is like one of the most common used words in the whole movie. You know? You've been on the Disney ride, right? You know, where everybody's drunk. You know, you're the only sober ones there. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, okay, yeah, if, if that's what you want, then yeah, we'll, we'll switch to something much more acceptable, you know, like, like knives and guns and, and uh, swords and things. That's, that's perfectly fine. Got it. So you, your playfield underside, once you get all of the uh, RGB LED boards in here, you get all of the mechanisms, the wiring, it starts to take its natural forms. Um, yeah, it comes a long way too, so you're working above and below the playfield towards a common goal, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite an undertaking, no pun intended. And that Maelstrom ramp that we talked about before, well, here it is in its final-ish form. It's not too final because these are the kind of things you learn when you prototype, is like, you know, that's Maelstrom. So there's an M underneath here that got covered up. Somebody forgot there's a ramp flap on there. So those are kind of handy when you go, oh, decal guy, come here, look at this, you know, art, move that up a little bit. 
we need to move this whole word up. So those are kind of things that you learn in a prototyping process. But uh, that was a ramp as it went to, to Expo last year. That's Fernando over there. He looks very satisfied and happy with the first cabinet that, that we put out here. Looks very good. All the sculptures, prototype sculptures and things, when they come in, we were scrambling to get all those at the last minute. For some reason, those guys making sculptures, they're the ones that take the, the, the most time to get everything just right. Those artists, artist guys, you know, and getting everything. You know, now we, we not only take your sculpture, we're gonna drill out in here and put RGB LEDs up inside all of these uh, lanterns. So, you know, we had some after work to do when they finally got their finished product to us. So we weren't finished with it yet, so. Uh, very exciting times, the first, final few weeks there before Expo last year. Prototype sculptures here again, you see all the, the different ships and the pieces on the Black Pearl. Um, lots, of, lots and lots of detail, very, very cool looking, very beautiful game. This is the Devil's Triangle um, sculpture that, that goes on the left side of the game. There's the big hole, shoot here and here, right there. There's a new thing done with pirates was that you know we were we we're not just going to take a couple of little th little eye candy things and, and make your CE game. We're going to give you a completely unique art package for the cabinet, for the play field, for the plastics that um, that are only available on the CE. The back glass, all that all that's going to be different. Of course, the topper. So it's it, it is truly a collector's edition of the game. There's a prototype game right before we went to uh, Expo last year. And what's next? This was Eric sitting outside the, the, at the Texas Pinball Festival talking to Mr. Thiel over here. For, and I come walking up and you see all these pinballs coming up behind his head. And I said, I gotta take that picture. Because that, that's really what I said. Now pose like you're really thinking. And then, then of course I had to coach him a little more. No, really thinking, Eric, you know, really thinking. You know. And so, yeah, that's kind of a cool shot. And how are we doing on time? Uh, I think we're almost there. It's 2.59. So. Yeah, we worked right on time then. Any questions? No time. Um, yeah, <laughs> you, you'll see Dave and I around. Uh, if you want to talk anything, I've got, you know, a lot of insight on the rules and things like that. They've, they've taught me. It's like quoting an encyclopedia. I did a whole session on that at the Golden State uh, Pinball Show. But uh, yeah, we, you know, you get a chance, say thank you to these guys running this show. You know, we wouldn't have this place, great place to come with all these like-minded individuals and, and have fun together if people didn't put on these shows. So thanks to all the Northwest Pinball and Arcade Show for having us, for setting all this up, for making it so cool and easy for us to just drop in and do our thing. Mike, Chase, thank you guys back there in the back. These guys, thankless task back there. Thank you guys, much appreciated. <laughs>